Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CDE Virtual. I'm delighted to, to have as my guest tonight, Jaime Saavedra. Um, he has served in a number of senior positions in the World Bank in Washington, in a number of institutions, but mainly at the World Bank, where he has focused on dealing with poverty, as well as shared prosperity and education reform, especially in Latin America. During his tenure as Minister of Education in Peru from 2013 to 2016, he introduced critical reforms to the schooling system with remarkably positive results. And I'm going to focus on those tonight. So Jaime, thank you for joining us this evening. It's great to have you. Thank you very much uh, and glad to be here. Great. Now, you came from the World Bank to take on the role of Education Minister in Peru in 2012. What made you make such a change from your career and uh, go back and become a minister? Well, obviously it was a uh, risky movement, right? Because, um, going into uh if, even if you think of yourself as a technocrat when you accept a ministerial position you're going into politics like it or not um and there's always uncertainty right you could have a you could accept the post and um have a cabinet crisis three months later and then the uh the experiment is gone right so it, it, true it was a lot of uncertainty of going on onto that however it was a good moment right um from the perspective of the bank, I had finished the work on redefining the mission of the bank towards poverty and shared prosperity. So that has a word that had work that had taken a couple of years. So I mean that was a um and and we were kind of like finishing that and started implementation. Uh, but there was there was it was um it was a ta a big task that had just been finished. And uh, from from the perspective of the country, um it was a good moment uh because there was political support uh, from the president and from the highest level in order to try to do something on education, right? So that was that was super important. Um, and also the government has uh, a relative ma majority um, in, in Congress. So it was also feasible to push certain reforms. So, I mean, the, uh, the, um, the uh, possibilities of doing something in the country, given the politics of that moment, um, uh, were good. Um, so the two things um, happen at the same time, and that's luck, right? I mean, those those uh, political windows of opportunity are just sheer luck. Um, you you cannot control those, um, but that's that's uh, the conditions were there, right? right? In order to try to to uh, to to jump into the pool uh, yeah. of politics. So I was interested to read because it seems to me unusual that you you said to the prime minister or the president that you had some preconditions before you took the job as a minister what were those preconditions for you and why well, yeah so well actually it was only one important precondition which was the uh, ability to choose your team right and do not have political do not have the need to respond to any to any 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 politics in terms of choosing who would be vice ministers or directors, etc. So to have complete freedom, right, in terms of defining um, who would be your team, right, and do not have any political interference on that. And that in general, that um, uh, the priorities or lines of action will be defined on a, on a technical basis, more than in a political basis. But actually, the of those two, two related things, the most important was the people, right? Mm. We should be able to choose the right team uh, right. In, in, in all the key positions. Right. And I understand that the, both the president and the minister of finance supported you in taking this position, which seems a, a really important factor here, enabling you to make the reforms you, you were able to do. Um, so how important was the support of the president and the minister of finance? So it's it was absolutely uh, critical on two fronts. First of all, 
uh, this um, not not only I mean this precondition was met in terms of yes I mean the answer to the president yes you have complete freedom to choose whoever uh, um, uh, is whoever is the right person to be there. He just said, well, that just don't choose someone radical from the opposition, right? That it's a, a blatant enemy of the government. They said, well, obviously you're not going to do that. But um, but the important thing is that that promise was kept. Uh, and it was kept not only at the beginning, but it was kept throughout the three mm -hmm. years uh, plus that I was uh, that I, that I that I was minister. So I didn't have um, from the president uh, any political interference. I mean, I I had a lot of requests from the from the president. And a lot of push from the president to do things, but it was like some push was to do things that were impossible because it was not possible to make progress so fast. But it was fine. I mean, it was a good pressure, sometimes complicated, but it was the it was re I mean reasonable that a president says, "Well, we're not we're making progress faster on this, right?" Um, I mean, this bureaucracy doesn't work. I mean, efficiently it doesn't work fast. I mean, pu push your team. But that's fine. I mean, that's a that's a that's a pressure I can I can live with. That's that that was okay. So the key thing for me it was that um, uh, political support um, was there throughout, right? It was also in terms of uh, dealing with Congress, dealing with the uh, dealing with the uh, with the union. Um, in general, there was support from the executive as a whole, and then from the Minister of Finance was very important. I mean, it was a it I I was. Uh, it, it was uh, useful for me that I, I knew the minister of finance. The, I only had to work with two ministers of finance during during all that period, which was good. Was relatively stable for Latin American standards. That's a lot of stability, right? Just two ministers of finance for one president. That's a lot of stability. Um, so th that was good. It was it. There was a big tension, of course, right? Because we were pushing for more resources. Actually, we got one point additional point of GDP in terms of of uh, ad expenditures to to for education. But for the Minister of Finance, that was like I mean pulling teeth. So it was not easy. It was a complex um, relationship. Each one has to do their job, right? I had to push for more resources. The Minister of Finance has said, "Well, yeah, but everyone is asking for more resources, right? Why don't you be more efficient with what you have first? And then we talk about money. I say, well, no, I need to do two things at the same time. For some things, I need more resources. And true, and other things, I need to be more efficient. So it was a big tension, but it was the reasonable tension. Um, and uh, and the other thing that uh, was very important for us was from the Ministry of Education to have a kind of an, a horizontal relationship with the Ministry of Finance, right? And one way that that we did that was to bring some people for our to our secretary secretariat within the within the ministry to the secretariat of planning and to the uh, budget unit to bring people from the ministry of finance mm -hmm. to the ministry of education so mm -hmm. we we stole a few people a, a few people and he was not happy neither about that but it was critical because it's very important that when you have budget discussions between a social sector and the ministry of finance right that you speak the same language Right, that is absolutely critical. So that was very important uh, uh, for us as well. Hmm. Great. Now you you took over as minister at a, a difficult time in education. You had come last. Peru had come last in a, a famous international test. I think of sixty five countries. Can you tell us how you decided to respond to that? Uh, there are different ways of dealing with that. We've seen this in South Africa. How did you deal with coming last? Yeah, uh, that was an, an expected surprise. Um, again, those are political moments that you don't choose; they just happen. But it happened that two about two months after I I, I took over that uh, the ministerial position, the uh, two thousand that was late two thousand thirteen. So the two thousand twelve PISA results came up came came out right. It takes about a year for PISA to process all the data. So the the data was out about two months after. And um, so uh, we knew a couple of weeks in advance, which is the usual, right? I mean, they share with the uh, country teams uh, the uh, the results in order to check that everything is fine from a technical perspective. So we knew a few a few or a few days earlier, right? That that was the result. And actually, Peru had improved in terms of the scores, right? In all in all the, in the three subjects in, in in science in reading and learning in reading and math, Peru had improved. 
But unfortunately, with a combination of other countries that have improved faster or other countries that have left uh, PISA um, that had done bad, and they say, well, I prefer not to take not to take the uh, the this um, uh, this assessment um, because of that combination of things. Peru was last, right, and literally last, not next to last, not bottom ten percent, not last, right. Um, so there were two options. One was to say, well, which has happened in other countries. One was to say, well, but no, this is a this is an OECD assessment that is not attuned to the realities of Peru, right? This not not for us. But we didn't 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 uh, choose that route. Uh, we chose the route of saying, look, um, uh, we need to own these results. We um, first of all, in terms of announcement, we agreed with the main newspaper of the country to say, well, we'll go with you at six a.m., which is given the time difference between Peru and Paris. It was noon in Paris when their results are going to be announced. So it was that 6 a.m. in Peru. So you can go in your newspaper uh, in, in your daily and say Peru is last in the world. And actually, it was in the front page, hmm. a large headline, main newspaper of the country. Uh, so education was in the news, which ne usually never happens, unfortunately, never happens. Um, now, it was not great news. So we said, look, this is a disaster. Um, this is a very bad result for the country, and this basically show that shows that we're not in trouble, that we are in deep trouble, right? Peru is a country that has grown during the last 15 years, but unfortunately, that growth has not translated into uh, important improvements in education. We could have said, uh, but Peru has improved, right? Say, well, but that's a detail. Nobody will care about that. The news were Peru is last. And actually, in radios, the people were saying Peru is last of the world, which was not true neither, right? Because it's 60-something countries, uh, usually mostly OECD countries and middle-income countries. But they were saying Peru is last of the world, even doing worse than the low-income countries. So we didn't spend too much time in terms of clarifying, but in terms but it's saying, look, okay, so we're in trouble. We need to move, we need to move forward. Um and and I think that that was useful in order to create momentum. Right, in order to push on the teachers' reform and to push also on the uh, more resources for for education. So that was the strategy, right? To use those bad results to say to recognize them, sir, we're in deep trouble. We need to do something, right? That was the strategy. So one of the things that you've said that I was intrigued by, you you argued that reform needs to be explained to to citizens of Peru to people in such a way that normal human beings could understand both the problem and the approach. This is an interesting thing to say. Um, one would think this was obvious to politicians and to officials, but clearly not. What were the circumstances which led you to make the statement? Mm. So, um, well, two, two things. Um, one was that, um, First of all, I mean, we had the belief that the key issue was teachers, right? That, I mean, the key thing was to improve the quality of the human resource, right? In an activity that is intense in human interaction, which is education. I mean, the magic of learning happens in that interaction between the teacher and the student. So that human factor is the most important thing. But remember that we were implementing a teacher's reform, right? And when teachers were going to be assessed, right? So we needed to, we, we had that fight. And at the same time, we needed to say, look, I mean, teachers are to a certain extent a problem that has to be solved. But at the same time, teachers are the solution. Teachers are the uh, main partner in terms of making any change in terms of improving quality. So that was, that was our narrative, right? It has to be about improving how we support and we work together with teachers. But then aside from that, when you have the discussion about what to do in education, uh, Peru is a country that has many others have a, a, a national education plan that it was, a, I mean, it was a thick book that, I mean, included all the different elements. I mean, there are many things that you need to improve in order to improve the quality of education systems. And there are many things that you can talk, that, that you can talk about. But we said, look, I mean, okay, we could have that thick book. That thick book is read by a few 
experts and no one else, right? There's no politician, no journalist, no one that will read that. Um, so we need to we need to come up with a simple message that gives com that conveys the uh, idea that yes, you do have a plan, right? And basically, the way we say it is: look, it's a clear plan. We need to work on four things. We need to work on teachers. We need to work on learning outcomes. We need to work on infrastructure, and we need to work on improving management. That's it, right? Now, be. I mean, within those four elements, there are many, many details, right? But the average politician, the average journalist, the average um, um, business person just needs to have that, okay? So in order to move and improve quality of education, you need to work on those four things. Mm -hmm. Teachers, learning, um, infrastructure, and management. Now, actually, and just let me, finish with one idea of those four things teachers learning infrastructure um um management actually learning actually if you if you think it was we were talking about the pedagogical programs right so what is that you needed to actually your outcome is learning right what you needed to talk about is i need to improve the human factor the teachers i need to improve the pedagogical programs and interventions i need to improve the infrastructure and improve the quality of the management in the school and in the overall um and in the overall system uh, but when i say well pedagogical programs okay how many people would understand what the hell i'm talking about with pedagogical problems just with that phrase right i will lose right half of the audience so i just replace the word pedagogical problems with learning Right, just for people to have, I mean, an easier understanding, right, of what this is about. Then, when you shift to the audience that is a more educational experts, then you can find use use all the complicated words that you want. But you need to have one message that is easier to say in the radio, right? We need to move on these four things, and that will imply um, improving the quality of the service that children receive. And I use the these are four pillars, or you can talk about these four wheels of a car. And for that car to move, those four wheels need to move at the same time, right? So um, so that gave the impression for the non-experts, like, okay, that sounds like a plan, right? Uh, now, when you talk to the experts, then you need to go on all the details, right? But I mean, you always need to think of the different audiences in which you want to convey a message. Hmm. Great, Let, let's dig a little below those four pillars. Tell us some of the critical reforms you introduced for teachers, for principals, and any of the others that you think are really important. Mm -hmm. Because South Africa's wrestling with a lot of this as well. So let me mention a couple of things. Um, one is, and I think the most important, um, is uh, the implementation of the teachers' uh, reform, which was basically a shift uh, from a situation in which sometimes the uh, selection of teachers and of principals and their promotion was either based on politics or promotion sometimes was based on just pure tenure or having just papers that show that they have done some training that you don't know if it was useful or not. Um, so um, so the key thing with there was to take politics out of any discussion about how to handle your human resource uh, within the education sector. So then the uh, selection of teachers was totally meritocratic. Um, so there was an examination, which we could talk about this, the characteristics of that examination. It's a complicated process, right? In order to select teachers, where you're talking about thousands of people that must be selected. Um, and then also introduce um, if, uh, as, assess teachers' assessments in order to uh, um, um, in order to promote teachers. So it was a shift towards a completely meritocratic career. And second, also, it was to the the idea of of giving much more weight to the principal. Right. Unfortunately, as as in many many countries, many Latin American countries or world or or in other regions as well, um, principals are usually either politically selected or the teacher with more tenure, right? And none of those things will ensure that that person will be the right leader that you need in order to uh, manage 
an institution that it's so complicated at its school, right? Sometimes there's not that recognition that managing a school is extremely, extremely difficult, right? You're managing the lives of 1,000 kids, right? Of a body of 30, 40 teachers. You need mm. to handle the community. You need to handle the parents. It's a very, very tough job. Right. So you need a person that has the motivation, that have the skills, and also you provide them the right training in terms of managerial and leadership uh, abilities. So those two things, I think, were absolutely critical. The, the whole merit of practical reform regarding teachers, the selection of principals in a completely different way. And an another important element was that that focus on learning. Uh, I, uh, Peru, I had I, I was fortunate that several years ago, since 2007, Peru had a very, very strong measure um, uh, um, uh, unit that mm. did um, um, uh, as learning assessments and measurements. Um, so Peru had census-based um, uh, uh, learning data since 2007 or 8. Um, and that's something that we used a lot, right, in terms of making sure that all schools will know the data mm -hmm. about their own levels of learning, right? And the tra their own trajectory of the levels of learning. So our measurement of learning was not a sample to see how, where the country is, but it was a census in which we'll know exactly where each school is, mm. right? So those were a couple of features that I think were important. Mm. Very interesting. Um, I, I want to build on one of those things I often think that managing education in a country like South Africa is one of the hardest challenges, and you've just referred to that, that we tend to think about uh, schools and teaching, but actually it's a management challenge. So tell us a bit about the kind of people you brought into the department. I think you said that you brought in 55 out of 60 new people into the education department in critical jobs. What sort of skills did they have? How did you think about it? How different was it from what you found when you went there? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I mean, the uh, I don't think there is always um, an internalization of society that the education sector is a macro sector from many perspectives, right? I mean, you can, the education sector in many countries could be one fifth or easily, easily will reach one fifth of your public sector. Right in terms of budget, right. Mm -hmm. In many cases, is your large is the largest um, uh, employer within the public sector, and it's one of the largest employers in the country, right. So you can move aggregate demand in a country with education interventions. So mm -hmm. education is a macro sector, just from that short run perspective. Education is a macro sector because it defines the level of productivity and capacities of innovation of the country. So education is a macro sector also from that medium and long-term and long-term perspective. And it is a gigantic sector, right? In a medium, medium-sized country like Peru, right? You're talking about 60,000 schools, right? So one need to, needs to think that that, and unless the country is federal, um, that minister is in charge of delivering that service in 60,000 places every day to cater whatever eight or nine million students working with half a million teachers so that's a gigantic right uh infrastructure that has to move every single day right and to provide a service that is a complex service right the service is not giving a drug it's not just i mean i will say just giving a vaccine right it's complicated to reach everyone to give it a vaccine but you do you do just once right or three times, right? Here is a service that is a complex interaction on a day-to-day -day basis to millions of kids. So the machinery in order to make sure that that happens efficiently is a gigantic and complex machinery, right? And for that, then you need to have um, an institution that obviously must have pedagogues, must have teachers because, I mean, they need to define the service that you're gonna be providing inside each of the classrooms. But you need an army, right, of planners, of lawyers, of engineers, of software programmers, right, of public administration experts, right, that will allow the flow of money and of inputs 
that is needed that has to arrive to each one of those 60,000 schools every day, right? So that is a, a, a gigantic, I mean, management challenge. And sometimes we don't internalize that. Mm -hmm. if, if you think, well, do we know how one school, do we know how one school works and what we need to for one school to work well? So yes, we know to a large extent. We know that, right? You need a good teacher, right? That teacher has to have good lesson plans, has to have the right method, and all kids have to have a workbook, right? And you have a basic infrastructure. If you have that, you're solving a good chunk of the problem. Not everything, but a good chunk of the problem. That sounds not that difficult, right? That's not rocket science, right? What is complicated is that you need to do that, right? In thousands and thousands of classrooms every yeah. day. That's the challenge that countries have. And that, too, as, as you were saying, that's a management challenge, not only a pedagogical challenge. Hmm. Hmm. I liked your story about the joke that the finance minister used to have about the Ministry of Education before you arrived. Could you tell us the story and how you changed that? The joke about the Ministry of Education being the bank. Being the bank? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> No, so that was, I mean, the, uh, the, um, and that's not only Peru, many, many countries, there is this um, typical discussion between ministers of education, and ministers of finance, the minister of education say, I need more money, the minister of finance saying, no, you don't, right, because we gave you a budget last year, and you were not able to execute that budget, right, so, um, um, so why do, why do you need more resources? And there was a kind of like internal, right? An internal joke of the um, in the Ministry of uh, of the of Finance said, "Well, our Education Ministry, that's the bank. We put money at the beginning. We know that they're not going to be able to spend it, right? So we can take out money at the end of the and at the end of the of the of the year or in the middle of the year and put it somewhere and put it somewhere else, right? That's what that's one of the things I really wanted to change, right? And and it 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 did change, but to do that, actually." That's not the skill of a teacher. That's not a skill of an education expert. That's a skill of someone who has knows a, knows very well all the intricacies, right, of the plumbing of um, of um, financial management in the public sector. Mm -hmm. And those skills were in the Ministry of Finance, right? That's why I need to steal people from the Ministry of Finance and bring them to the Ministry of Education in order to precisely not make sure that the education ministry was not the bank of the rest of the public sector, right? So that was an important change for us. Right, right. Let's talk a bit more about teachers. Most teachers in many countries are unionized and this is a very difficult area in which to get reform. Can you tell us about how you thought about this? What challenges you had from unions? What were you able, how were you able to move forward with teachers uh, which are so central to the kinds of education reforms yeah. most countries need. No, you're, uh, th that's that's absolutely the most important uh, challenge, and 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 um, and I wouldn't say not only a critical element but an essential element of any of any reform. Right, teachers must have the right motivation and have must have the internalization that actually their job is not only to teach, their job is to make sure that all kids learn, which is not exactly the same, right? If my job is to teach, well, I teach. If you learn, good for you. If you don't, well, what can I do? You Maybe you came without having had breakfast. There are problems at home, right? So it's your problem. Well, it's not. Right, the problem, the the challenge of the teacher, or the responsibility actually of the teacher, is to make sure that everyone learns. Right, noting that yes, some kids will require more support, more help, and more attention than other kids. That's the way it is. Right, but your responsibility is that everyone learns. So it was. Um, so, given given that, I think a key element was um, to, uh, in order to implement a reform in which in which uh, we were assessing teachers all for for entering the profession and for promotions i mean the they they had to play ball right they had to go to the evaluations 
right? So, so I think it was very important for us, first of all, to have a a, a close uh, working relationship with the union. Um, mm -hmm. It was easier because we were in a context in which we were we had the possibility to increase teacher salaries. Um, mm -hmm. But the deal was, well, we're going to increase teacher salaries, but not in a flat way, right? We were increasing teacher salaries, but some of you might get 70%, others will get 10, right? Depending on um, um, on, on on how they did in their, in their evaluations. And also the entrance to the career will depend on, um, uh, will depend on, on assessments. So, um, uh, so it was very important to maintain that dialogue with uh, with with teachers. It was useful that we were in a context in which we were able to to raise salaries, not dramatically, but we were able to 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 raise them. Uh, but also the narrative of the of the uh, of the government, and it was useful that it was very different from the previous government. The narrative of this government are was that teachers are the main partners of the reform. And there was nothing that we'll get, we're going to be able to achieve if if we didn't improve the support to teachers and and we we count on, on them. And then the other element was to um, increase investments in teacher support and teachers training and coaching. Uh, we started with a shift; it didn't uh, it, it took it took time and was not completed. Um, but I mean, we started the process of shifting the kind of training from something that was like the typical people going. Just to a room and get some get some training to something in which the um, uh, the teachers will be coached by someone uh, mm -hmm. by a, by a more experienced a more experienced teacher. So that was that was uh, not easy. I mean, it was a complex uh, dance with the uh, with the with the union, but it was absolutely critical. And then if, let me finalize with one point there. It was very important that the uh, public opinion was in favor of a meritocratic reform, that for public opinion, it was important that teachers were assessed, right? Um, there had been in the past an, an impression that the failures of public education uh, in the country were related to the capacity of teachers. Um, so in that regard, public opinion was saying, well, yes, teachers should be assessed. So that was, that was useful, but it was a combination of pushing towards public opinion, the idea that yes, teachers but we assess, but on the other hand, teachers are the critical element in order to have any improvement uh, on education. Hmm. Very interesting. So I've circled around this. What did you achieve in Peru in your time as education minister? What were the big results in your view? So, um, so there was true. There was an improvement in in learning in learning outcomes. I think, in part, on, in part related to a different attention paid to the teaching profession. Um, obviously, we started recruiting teachers with different standards, uh, but obviously that it would take time, right? Because I mean, changing the uh, the flow of teachers, you you will change you will and 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 selecting them. Well, uh, it's something that will imply a big shift only after after some time. But I think, I mean, given a, a different kind of support to teachers, paying a lot of attention to results, I mean, a lot of emphasis uh, in the public discourse about what was happening with learning outcomes, mm. right? A lot of discussion about that. And that was something that it was more in the news. What's happening with the learning outcome? Are our kids are able to read or not? Right. And then being able to show that, yes, there were some improvements and we always say, well, this is not enough. Right. This is like climbing at the 8000 meters um, um, mountain uh, and we have climbed the first 1000. Great. That's important. But we are not there yet. Right. But actually giving a lot of attention to learning and this improvement in learning outcomes that was useful. The other so, but that was that was um, on on basic education. The other element that was important was the shift to full secondary. Um, mm -hmm. So, Peru, as many other countries, have many secondary schools in which kids were. Um, I mean, there were um, two two shifts, and in some cases even three shifts, right? So, we started the change that has not been finished yet, right? Because we're in a in a middle sized country like Peru, we're talking about eight thousand secondary schools. 
um most of them were were had two shifts so we started the change to have a but I would say a regular secondary. We cut it full time secondary, but it was a regular secondary, right? In which instead of being three hours in school, right, you would be from eight eight a.m. to two thirty or so, and then the school will be also will be, mm. I mean, available for extracurricular activities and will continue being part of the life of young people and the community. So that was a big, uh, 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 a very important uh, shift as well. And then the other big uh, area in which we haven't talked about it was the university reform, right? That we uh, we introduce a new regulatory body in order to uh, uh, to define minimum standards for universities. Um, uh, that was a, a politically very complicated, but Peru, as many other countries, have had a, a a large increase in the number of universities, many private universities, some of them extremely good quality, very good, but many others. That were just diploma mills, uh, so it was important to introduce a, um, a a new body that will supervise the minimum quality um, and provide a license to you to universities. So that was uh, also an important line of work uh, during our times in the ministry. I liked your comment that Peru can't beat Brazil in soccer, but you could beat them in maths. So the question is, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did. We did in yeah. peace. Yeah, in PISA and some of the Latin American um, uh, assessments uh, done by UNESCO, um, Peru improved uh, and was able to beat Brazil in math. Well, despite the fact that not necessarily we have been successful in beating Brazil in 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 in, in soccer, but um, but it's true. I mean, that's uh, um, that I mean, within Latin America, Peru has been one of the countries that, until two thousand nineteen, has um, has and the last decade say has 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 improved faster than other than other countries on international tests. Like on international Israel. tests, yes, on international yeah. tests, both right. on PISA and and UNESCO uh, administered tests. Right. And how much did you improve? What's a reasonable amount for a country to aim at? Um, in those sort of international tests, yeah. So um, I I think the uh, so for instance I, I don't remember the, uh, the 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 exact numbers, but for instance in our um, in our national assessments uh, regarding uh, reading um, in between two thousand uh, say ten and and sixteen. Peru improved like fifteen points, right? From or bit from thirty to almost to almost fifty, which was a large jump, right? Mm -hmm. I I think that that was a very very large jump. I would presume that improving more than fifty percent of kids being able to read with understanding would have been more difficult, uh, or will be more will be more complicated. Um, but I think that's doable, right? So if you do have a shift of the school system towards a focus on what's really happening in the classroom and an understanding by the whole com by the whole community that you are really there about learning uh, that can generate changes in the short term. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm it's important to mention those numbers because I, I think it's wrong that sometimes we say it in uh, regarding education that we say, um, uh, look, education changes, education changes in education take time. Mm -hmm. Right. So you need to be patient and say, well, of course, if you want to convert a middle income country like Peru or South Africa and have the levels of uh, Estonia or uh, uh, or Finland. Yes, that will take some time. True. Uh, but you can make changes right in the fund and at least foundational skills. Right. Um, in uh, in in the short term, right. In three, four years, you can start seeing changes. You still are not going to be where you want to be. But you can make changes with the teachers you, you have if the teachers have the right um, the right methods, if the teachers have the right support, if teachers have lesson plans and they have a better guidance in terms of what to do each single day. And if uh, in and and if if you make sure that more schools have the right principle, right, a, a person can then really organize well the workings of the of the institution. And those are things that really do not have do not require years and years, right? Oh. In order to make sure that all teachers have a good lesson plan, 
that's something that you can do and implement, even if you're starting from scratch, that you can do in a few years. So so change can happen in the short run and not necessarily education. Always changes in education take uh, take long. Mm. Very important point. Um, let me turn to something you said earlier. How does one get parents and other parts of society and the media and how do you get everybody as concerned about the quality of schooling as you are? You seem to have got done quite well in that in Peru. How, how did you do it? Are there any techniques that you can share with us? I don't, I don't know if, if techniques, but um, <laughs> but I think it's very important to reach the broader uh, policy community and to reach the public. I think one mistake that sometimes many, many people working in education is that they either preach to the choir or engage in complex discussions who could be very important discussions with their tribe, right? And that's fine. I mean, you need to convince your tribe, right? But that's not the most important thing, right? If you want to improve quality of education, you don't need to convince the tribe. You need to convince the other people in the cabinet that don't know anything of what of education. I mean, although in education, everyone thinks everyone has an opinion about education, yeah. right? And that's a challenge. But um, but still, if you say, okay, so what the, the critical interventions are these three or four things, right? It's not to convince the experts, right? And I many say that said, look, no offense, but you're not the uh, um, you're not you're not the audience. I don't care too much about convincing the education experts only. That's not the most important things. Many of the education experts know the problem, right? And know the and and also know, might know the solution. The key thing is that you need to make that change at scale, right? And for that, you need the prime minister, your minister of finance, right? First of all, them, I mean, with you, you need to make sure that Congress understands what is that the challenges are and what is the has, has, has to happen. And then you do need to convince the public, right? So this issue that you were asking at the beginning, right? Um, how 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 to summarize what we were doing. He said, well, let's summarize it in four wheels of a car, in four pillars, right? That's useful because that's easier to communicate, right? Than all the details that are the reality, that are reality, the many issues on decentralization, on financial management, right? On the uh, the methods to teach uh, to teach how to read, uh, how do the the teachers the teacher salary structure? There are many many details that are critical for education reform, but you don't convince anyone with that, right? You need to say, this is the problem. We need to focus on improving the quality of what's happening in the classroom. And we, in order to do that, we're gonna do these four things, right? That's one important thing. And the other thing that is important is that, is is the measurement thing. And that you usually um, in, uh, brings a lot of criticism, usually of the tribe, right? Of per people working on education is they say, well, we need to measure learning. Now, the problem is that learning and the education, the quality of education is an holistic experience. So at the end of the day, what you really want is a child to be happier, right? And a child that will have the tools, right? In order to be a good productive citizen, right? And there are many things, many traits that you need to make sure that that child acquires in school. However, we can, we don't know how to measure all those things. We don't know how to measure that holistic experience, right? We just don't know yet how to do it. However, we can measure decently if they can read and we can measure decently if they can do basic math and their basic knowledge of science. So, well, let's at least measure that and let's make sure that, I mean, that we, uh, that society as a whole right, looks at what's happening with those outcomes, right? And and some people say, well, but then that implies that the teacher will focus only on reading. I will say, well, in many of our countries, if they solve the reading issue, I'll be very happy. Mm. If all kids in South Africa know how to read by the end of primary, I will be a very happy man, right? And that will be, that applies exactly to the whole Latin America, right? Yeah. And, and Peru as well. 
right? So, I mean, let's be realistic, right? We need to achieve those. Now, happens to be as well that a teacher and a school that is able to uh, achieve that, a kid that reads with understanding and with joy at the end of primary, right? Most likely is a school that is giving that child also a good education in the other subjects. And also it's most likely a school in which the kid feels happy, that kid feels stimulated, that they are fostering creative thinking, that the kid feels safe, right? Most likely all those things are happening. Maybe not always, but most likely if you're achieving also at the same time foundation, those foundational skills that we can measure. So we really need to focus um, to um, making sure that the whole system, parents, teachers, principals know what's going on, right? And you can only do that measuring at least whatever we know how to measure. So one of the, I want to push a little bit about parents. Often parents have had worse schooling than their children are getting, however bad that is. And so one of the explanations people give me is that that's why they don't sort of go out in the street and shout about the terrible quality of education that they're getting. Were there examples where parents came out in support of your reforms or instances like that? And how did how did that work? So you're right. I mean, in many in many um, uh, middle income countries and low income countries, uh, usually uh, parents have less education than what their what their children are going to attain. Right. Um, so there are things. I mean, so two. Let, let me answer on two on two steps. On one hand, is that parents are trusting schools, right? Mm. And and if it's it, it is what you're saying, which you 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 might be right in many in many cases. The parent knows, doesn't know a lot about, I mean, might not even know how to read, right? But then it's like, it's like you, if you were enrolling your child in a, in, in a school for her to learn Chinese, right? How would you know if she's learning or she's learning a bit, but you will trust, well, this is a Chinese school. They say that children do well. Well, I assume that they are teaching them. I have no clue how to how to know if the way they are teaching Chinese is being effective or not. I and mean, if she really is getting the skills that I guess she was getting. So there's a lot of trust that people are putting in the education system by even by definition, right? So you was I mean, there's a, there's a school, there's someone there who looks like a teacher, there seems to be desks and books. So you assume, well, something must be happening there, right? And the unfortunately, not in LK, not in, in many cases, not much is happening there, right? Mm-hmm. We know now that schooling is not learning; that many kids are in school and, and are not learning. So, so there is a part of responsibility that is of the system and of people who are running the schools and of the teachers, in the sense that parents are put in society are putting trust that inside those schools something is happening. On the other hand, yes, you need to engage. And sometimes happens and sometimes not. Uh, more with parents, for parents to push uh, for reform. Some things are easier for parents to understand what's going on. In in my case, for instance, one thing that was very clear was the push for uh, the the full shift schools, right? The the the, the full time schools, right. right? It was easier for parents to see. Well, what's happening in these schools? Kids are kids are staying until two p.m. Uh, they have shifted this school. So what I would have when I w- was going to those schools, many th- in many cases, what happened is that outside there were a bunch of parents waiting for me of the other school that has not been transformed yet, and asking, "Well, when is our turn? Why you have shifted? Why you have transformed this school? And what about mine? That it's I mean I mean one kilometer away." Right. And we're waiting for hours. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was easier for parents to see, well, this is a change. Right. Kids are happier. Teachers are fine. Um, um, uh, I mean, the experience is better. Kids are longer in school. I also want that. Why are not I'm not getting it. That was easier for parents to see the change and to demand that that change. So that that in, in that's one example in which you saw parents saying, "Okay, I want it. Right. The other thing was what I was mentioning before 
when society was saying that it's good that teachers are assessed, hmm. right? Society as a whole said, yes, it's good that teachers are, are assessed. And it was so important and so um, well-received, say, by people that that should be the case. And so important for people that years later, it's when a new president in Peru was actually a unionized teacher, that at some point he said, well, I'm going to reverse that reform of meritocracy and uh, and um, and having teachers being assessed. He then had to stop saying that because that was very unpopular with people in general. Hmm. Right. So, okay. yes. So so it's tricky. So yes. it's not that uh, there are some instances in which it's easier to bring parents to that is to the discussion but when that happens it can be very powerful how unusual is peru and the successes you were able to achieve by 2019 are there other countries in latin america middle income developing countries that that also introduced reforms and managed to to get results in the short term and sustain it for a while um well not a lot, mm. um, unfortunately. So Peru made some progress, but first of all, as I say, I wouldn't say that Peru is already a success in the sense that there were some improvements, but Peru is not where it should be uh, at all yet. Um, and I, for instance, in Latin America, there are a few um, provinces or, or regions that have improved. So. There's a very, very interesting example, for instance, of some states in Brazil, particularly the state of Ceará in Brazil, which actually they did that. They had, they also had a meritocratic reform in order in the way they selected teachers and um and and principals. They started measuring uh on a census based, uh, so all schools will know what their outcomes were. Teachers received the right support and the right incentives. So and there has been dramatic improvements during the last 15 years in Ceará in Brazil. Mm. We see more recently important improvements in the province of Mendoza in, uh, in, in Argentina, for instance. Uh, we have seen long-term improvements in Chile, um, but unfortunately, the world is not necessarily moving on the right direction. Hmm. Right on when we talk about this uh, indicator that we uh, have were uh, working here at the World Bank since 2019 on learning poverty, which is just the share of children who um, uh, who cannot read by age 10, so at the end of primary, um, that number was 57 percent before the pandemic in low and middle income countries in general. So more than half of kids were not able to read with understanding by the end of primary, right? But the other bad news, there are two bad news, is that the number was moving in the wrong direction even before the pandemic. Right. So right. before the pandemic, there was slight increase in that learning poverty, in that in share of children who were not able to read with understanding. So, because we could have said before the pandemic, look, we're not doing well, but actually we're moving in the right direction. No, the world was not moving in the right direction before the pandemic. And then the pandemic hit, right? Mm. So the number's worse now, mm. right? With the uh, very long school closures in many parts of the world, particularly in, in, in South Asia and Latin America. Africa was much more uh, heterogeneous. But I mean, but many, many places we've seen school interruptions for one entire year or even two entire years. Uh, so that has been a disaster. Uh, so the learning poverty has increased. Right. So that that is what uh, makes us say that we were in a learning crisis before the pandemic that has been deepened by the pandemic. So um, so I think it's very important that so, that as as societies we have a good understanding that we're not moving in the right direction globally, and even countries who are improving must improve at a much, much faster a faster pace. Let me end, we're running out of time. So let me ask my last question, which was going to be about the pandemic. 
people say that for many countries, the learners have lost at least a year of, of education. Are there some? So what do you recommend countries do? And are there some countries that are not just business as usual, but trying to deal with this unprecedented crisis, really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, look, there there's a package of interventions uh, that countries can implement in order to try to cope with this crisis and actually try to accelerate learning because we need to recover time, right? So at the end of the day, we need, I mean, you're not going to recover all the learning that was lost or forgotten, right? For that um, eight-year-old or 12-year-old that is today in school, right? But we must um, shift our curriculums and and our uh, support to children such that in three or four years, those kids should have the same learning levels that they sh would have had without a pandemic. Mm. Right? It might take some time, true, fine. But then even, even in, a, in a few years, those kids should, be, should recover from this shock in a way that they are at a level as if there was, would have been no pandemic. Now, our countries implementing like um, simplification of curriculums, more tutoring, more more hours, uh, better measurement of learning in of of learning in school, etc. Are countries implementing that? The answer is that it's very heterogeneous, right? We made an assessment about um, a couple of months ago, and we find that say one in one in four countries or one in five countries are in implemented implementing interventions aimed at recovering learning, right? Uh, interventions, for instance, that also include uh, making sure that all kids are back to school, uh, giving more um, mental health support to uh, to children, right? And then intensifying their interventions, at least to make sure that they have the foundational skills, right? We saw very interesting recovery mm -hmm. interventions um, a few months ago that I was in Western Cape. Uh, I mean, they, they, the first important thing was that there was an internalization by the Ministry of Education that, yes, we're in trouble, right? We cannot go back to business as usual. We need to do things in a much more intense way. Uh, um, so, and, and they had a package of interventions more or less um, aligned to what I, what I was saying. Unfortunately, we don't see that everywhere in the world. We see that in some countries and some provinces and some regions within countries, but not but not everywhere, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. we're not on track yet in order to, to, for us to say, to be able to say, yes, we are accelerating in order to recover kids from this shock. No, we're not there yet. And if that doesn't happen and it doesn't happen fast in the next few years, you would have a generation that will have less productivity than the previous generation and the next generation, right? And they will have, that will imply not only less productivity, but a less flow of income in the future, not for the economy, but for that generation that happened to have between five and 20 years when the pandemic hit. And yeah. you need to remember and close with this, um, the huge shock that we have also in early child education. Mm. Right? We have been saying during the last 15 years that the highest social return and private return on education comes from our investment in early child education, right? Making sure that they have the kids have the right stimulation in their years four, five, and six in their lives. Well, early child education disappeared completely, right? And was not replaced by Zoom or anything, right? Disappeared completely from the lives of those kids. So precisely that thing that we were saying is that has the highest return was the investment one to zero. Right. So those kids are not having, I mean, yeah. and their year four and your year five of life disappeared. Right. Um, so we need to make sure that those kids have the stimulation today such that in a few years they have the same level of cognitive development as if there would have been no no pandemic. And there's a huge task uh, mm. that is pending. Right. Well, we've come to the end of our time. I think the audience will have seen why we were so keen to have 
Tammy on our platform this afternoon. This has been a real education in <laughs> education reform. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think Peru was very lucky to get somebody like you to take over the ministry and to introduce a whole lot of reforms that certainly were bearing, fu bearing fruit. Thank you very much for your time. Thank Thanks, you very man, much, everybody. Um, we'll, we'll close now.